<coughs> the title of our event today, of course, is uh, about legitimation strategies and the 2020 and 2021 uh, significant changes have been afoot. Um, and we have four uh, speakers and a discussant today for this fascinating topic. Um, and we start with the conceptual side of the whole question of legitimation. Our first speaker is Sophia Duboulet. Uh, she's a Marie Curie Fellow and a PhD candidate in political science at Oxford Brookes University. Her main research interests are related to the study of authoritarian regimes, including their political stability and legitimation in Central Asia and the Caucasus. Her research has been published in Problems of Post-Communism and Theorizing Central Asian Politics, the State, Ideology and Power, Palgrave Macmillan 2019. I'll give you the floor, Sophia, to get us started today. Thank you very much, Matthew, for inviting me for this um, interesting panel with distinguished speakers. Um, uh, as Matthew already mentioned, uh, my role today is um, more to present some theoretical framework for understanding autocratic legitimation rather than discussing um, more empirical um, specificities of its implications in Putin's Russia. But I would try to mention a few details. Um, but overall, I'm generally specializing on Central Asia and South Caucasus. So I'm uh, sorry in advance if some of the res references will be inappropriate. Okay. So, um, it's quite important to understand and distinguish what makes some authoritarian regimes last for a long period of time while others collapse after their establishment. Um, and one of the ways to conceptualize uh, authoritarian durability could be via the framework of legitimation. Uh, first of all, um, it's um, dominant uh, studies on political theory and political philosophy normally would link um, legitimation and legitimacy to uh, analyze democratic regimes. And um, therefore, autocracies or non-democracies, other hybrid forms of regimes, were always staying a little bit on the... Um, uh, outside of the forefront of legitimation studies. But uh, I believe that it is important to um, include uh, legitimizing strategies for authoritarian themes, even though they might seem to be a bit oxymor uh, oxymorous. Um, so there are two big classical studies in relation to political legitimacy. And first one, of course, you all know uh, Max Weber, uh, economy and society, and the big critique um, that uh, Beaton wrote late in 1991 um, in his work, he was trying to unpack uh, legitimacy conception that was provided by Max Weber. And as you know, according to Weber, um, Weber defined legitimacy as a belief in legitimacy, claiming that power is legitimate where those involved in it believe in it uh, to be so. Legitimacy derives from people's belief in legitimacy. And Beaton found a lot of um, uh, difficulties uh, comprehending legitimacy um, of uh, the Weberian concept. First of all, uh, he uh, explains that uh, not every individual in a society can distinguish legitimacy and illegitimacy, uh, because a lot of rational and some subjective standards um, uh, come to play while um, measuring legitimacy. Secondly, uh, Beaton believed that um, uh, it is a purely normative claim, and it's very difficult to understand uh, what does uh, Weber believes as a um, norm and believe in legitimacy. And third, he says that um, um, it faces a lot of methodological issues in measuring different aspects of legitimation. 
and uh, therefore Beaton uh, brings his argument further and he comes with the suggestion that uh, legitimacy is not just about the uh, preservation of political order, but it's also about the degree of cooperation and quality of state performance um, that engenders the relationship between the ruler and um, his or her subordinates. But obviously what Beaton misses from this picture is, um, or as many art scholars except for a few, is that um, while considering legitimation processes, we always look into democracies and only in very few times we would think about autocratic legitimation. And uh, in one of uh, recent uh, publications uh, I co-authored with my supervisor, Rick Isaacs, who came to a new definition of autocratic uh, legitimation, um, where we argue that uh, autocratic legitimation is primarily the process by which legitimacy is produced. Um, and um, the aim of um, legitimation process is in um, uh, creating the state of legitimacy uh, where um, the ruler would be and leadership would be viewed as the right, proper and morally correct for that particular society. So below you can see the process of legitimization in autocratic regimes. So first it starts with a specific set of discursive strategies or, or some would call it input uh, discourses. Uh, it's a set of strategies that define uh, values and norms of that regime. Well, in the case of uh, modern Russia, we could think of, uh, I don't know, uh, retraditionalization of uh, Russian values um, or the uh, great uh, Russia mythology. Uh, and secondly, so first starts with the idea, and then this process leads to the concrete set of uh, policy um, actions uh, or activities, because uh, if we only think about ideology uh, or um, some uh, discursive indoctrination that doesn't really translate into action, um, citizens would probably not believe in the validity of that uh, legitimacy. Mm. So, um, uh, at the outcome of the process of legitimization, uh, we see the uh, belief in legitimacy. So it, it has been born uh, through this uh, whole set of um, two processes, from the idea to um, activities to the formulation of uh, legitimacy, which is problematic in, its, in itself, as you understood. And also uh, one of the important contribution of um, these strategies, perhaps understanding that the difference of autocratic legitimacy is in the is rooted in the desire for the incumbent regime to legitimize itself within the elite circle. Um, the main audience of um, legitimation in autocracies could be not always uh, popular masses, but rather um, smaller circles of competing elite groups. Um, that's why you have this um, definition of self-legitimization. So, and here um, I suggest uh, to look into the um, three distinct uh, strategies of authoritarian self-legitimization. The first one is deal with um, discursive domain or input discourses. And here we can think about uh, foundational myth of states. It's a specific um, formulation of historical narratives. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, regime is trying to uh, present um, a very singular um, polished version of um, past reality uh, without allowing any interpretation 
um, because it's much easier for for the regime to impose its um, ideological domination through presenting the so-called truth through a singular um, um, narrative or dominant discourse. And uh, we can see how um, uh, history textbooks uh, are being rewritten in Russian. Um, there are more um, restrictive laws on uh, propaganda and uh, educational programs. Uh, the second um, um, tactic of uh, input discourses relates to charismatic domination. Um, I think, and that's how probably uh, my reading of the main um, literature on Russia, uh, Putin himself isn't a charismatic leader, but uh, the discourse around it tries to um, routinize his charisma uh, through different um, um, uh, speeches, uh, masculine performances, images. Um, and um, so obviously charismatic domination is important in relation to a discursive space because you would like not only adore your leader, you don't want to be um, simply obedient uh, citizen, but you would like to enjoy living in the country um, you reside. Uh, the second um, set of um, tactics relate to symbolic spectacles. Uh, these are the um, particular set of performances um, that uh, tries to um, that aim to instigate the sense of loyalty and belonging to a nation. Um, and um, as we know, uh, Russia is um, doing a lot of work on the its international on promoting its international image through participating in global mega events, um, Olympic Games, um, and other activities. And um, any autocratic regime that exists today um, doesn't want to be associated with the despotic um, uh, rule of the past. It, uh, uh, autocracies are quite uh, closely ingrained in the systems of modernization and modernity. That's why uh, for autocratic regimes, uh, it's important to come up with a set of development strategies. Um, even though they are not always closely um, performed or uh, realized, but it's important to claim that there is some sort of vision for, for the brighter future. And the third and unintended uh, strategy of authoritarian legitimization um, uh, is repression. Uh, political repression is used um, only as a last resort when soft legitimation strategies such as input discourses and symbolic spectacles fail. Mm. Um, so um, political coercion um, includes the act of um, high or low intensity uh, coercion that are targeting a particular groups of um, opposition or um, uh, individual um, protesting movements uh, to, to retain power, mostly. And media and internet control, um, I believe it's also a form of uh, low uh, intensity uh, coercion. Um, and um, there are a lot of laws that legally prohibit uh, journalists and other uh, activists uh, express their opinion or Mm, develop an alternative viewpoint on the regime. So overall, this is uh, it. it uh, this uh, uh, looks like a bit of a static um, approach on uh, authoritarian legitimation, but I believe um, they uh, those um, strategies are quite dynamic. They influence each other uh, and. Um, Authoritarian uh, leaders try to normally invoke at least two of those strategies for their regime to be seen as um, 
um, legitimate. And in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, the process of autocratic legitimization is a dynamic uh, paradigm with a specific properties, discourses and strategies by which actors inspire to maintain their right to rule. The persistent authoritarianism in post-Soviet countries offers insight into a liberal and non-democratic means of power justifiability. And as I already mentioned, at least two out of three self-legitimization strategies should be um, activated for regime to be considered as legitimate. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sophia. And that was a very well-timed presentation. I'm glad to say that our uh, chair is now with us. Uh, Edward had some technical difficulties connecting and I will, I will pass the floor to him. Uh, thank you very much, Edward Chats. Thanks very much. Um, Matthew, can I confirm that you're going next? That's correct. All right, <laughs> then I will, I will introduce uh, Matthew. Thanks for, um, thanks for having me in this role and thanks for your patience while I, uh, while I got online here. Um, so next we'll be hearing from Matthew Blackburn as a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Russian and Eurasian Studies. Um, he completed his doctoral thesis on nationalist discourses and the imagined nation in post-Soviet Russia at the University of Glasgow. His research is on political legitimation, memory politics, nationalism and identity politics in post-Soviet space. He's been published in nationalities papers, Russian politics, and look forward to your presentation. 15 minutes, right, Matthew? That's correct. I'll do my Perfect. best to keep to it. I'll keep you honest. I'll keep you honest. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'll, I'll get started. My, my, the, the title of my presentation today is um, 2020 as a legitimacy, legitimacy reboot. And this idea that the post-Crimea consensus is crumbling, which of course other authors have advocated, including uh, Dennis Wilkoff, who is our guest in today and one of our participants. Um, I have quite a lot to get through today, so I may have to skip some of my slides. But the first point I want to make is of course that a transformation is underway and we don't see the final product yet. And we don't have the definitive answers of what this transformation is that began in 2020. Um, but suffice to say that there is some scholarly consensus on the different versions that the Putin system has gone through, if we use the metaphor of an operating system version. 1.0 was formed from 20, 2000 to 2008, and then it was consolidated under Medvedev, it did not become something different. And there's quite a lot of consensus that uh, in 2012, version 2.0 was built, um, and there were some important changes, um, but the same kind of system is still evolving um, through. Um, so if, if, if most observers find this part agreeable, of course, what's going on now is less clear. Um, what is driving the current transformation? Is it a proactive implementation of a plan to secure stability and perform a reboot of legitimacy? Or is it better to see it as a defensive kind of improvised reactiveness based on a sense of increasing vulnerability, economic problems, falling ratings, and of course, before we had the lame duck problem, and increasing threats, foreign agents, oppositionists, protests, and of course, US pressure and influence, which is perceived by the Kremlin to be an important, an important issue. So perhaps it's both. Um, it's, it's an ambitious legitimacy reboot, and it's also an ad hoc improvisational response to problems that are more emerging. Um, so I'm glad that we got a conceptual introduction from Sophia because uh, we often um, are interested when we talk about legitima legitimation in an authoritarian context. We're very much interested in this question of authoritarian resilience. And this itself is a response to an old scholarly consensus of the 1990s, which broke down. That consensus was that authoritarian regimes were supposed to fade away in the 21st century because they would not be, be consistent with modernization theory. But of course, today we have a wide diversity of authoritarian models in the post-Cold War era. And we have neo-feudal Saudi Arabia, we have idiosyncratic theocratic Republic of Iran. We have the Chinese developmental state with its Leninist institutional hardware. Um, where does Russia fit in? Um, and well, I'd suffice to say, I won't go in through these points in detail, but suffice to say that Russia is probably not the role model of successful and resilient authoritarian power today. That's a question for discussion. Maybe we come back to later. But um, I very much enjoyed two, um, two um, books that I recently read or articles and books. Uh, Thomas Herber was looking at the resilience of the Chinese case 
Um, Alexander Lidman and Michael Rushwitz have written about federalism in China and Russia, comparing them. And I just want to make the point on, on a second point that it appears that the Chinese system has higher levels of trust, better local governance, um, a more successful developmental state, high state capacity, economic growth, technological innovation, and a federal system that is more responsive to the population and able to, to have powerful institutions that are flexible in their policy implementation. I just flag that because I think it's an interesting point, but we, we must get back to Russia, of course, and um, 2020 and our, our main, main focus of today. And um, what I want to talk about today is building on what Sophia said, is, is focusing on the first two points, inputs of legitimation and processes of legitimation, and trying to analyze them uh, across 2020, the year of COVID, start, starting in March 2020, essentially. Um, David Beatham had three dimensions of legitimation that he argued needed to be uh, examined. And I, and I also say there's extremely dynamic dimensions that, that change over time. One is, of course, rules that govern the acquisition and exercise of power. Another is beliefs, normative beliefs that are shared by both the dominant and the subordinate about the common benefits that a system of power provides. Three is appropriate actions public and symbolic acts that show the consent and loyalty of subordinates um, to a system of power before a mass audience. And again, I would underline what Sophia said. Sometimes the audience is the elite and the leader, and these not always the masses. Some of this is directed both ways. And there is the horizontal um, kind of axis of legitimation, which goes across the elite into elite co cohesion. And there's the vertical axis going down to the population, ruler ruled. Okay. Um, having discussed about concepts, I will now move on to the first uh, area that I'm going to examine in terms of 2020 and this idea of a legitimacy reboot and how successful it was. Um, the rules context um, for many people would appear not to be appropriate for Russia because there's this constant violation and changing of democratic procedures in, in, in inverted commas. But nonetheless, I disagree with that. I would say that in Russia, the rules dimension does refer to the procedure of winning elections and plebiscites. It's not a representative parliamentary democracy, the functional one. It's electoral authoritarianism, where power is delegated to a strong president who nonetheless should win plebiscite style mandate from the majority of the population. And um, if you had to rephrase this into a kind of thing, uh, like, a, like, a, like a catchphrase, uh, rules are made to be broken as long as the majority are, are behind it. Um, so there's not, there's not really a genuine contest for power in these uh, elections, but a lot of energy goes into them. Um, and, far, and unlike China, where the energy is not spent on these kind of things in local government. And it is a key legitimation strategy. So um, during lockdown, I think my first impression of the execution of rules in 2020 was all about the constitutional amendments and about the extension, well, of Putin's um, presidential terms. And there was lots of different aspects of this. Uh, I put in this uh, strange collage. I'll talk you through it very briefly. One of the things at the beginning of this uh, kind of procedure to um, change the Russian constitution was of course, some degree of sloppiness in the execution. The first part went fine. The government re reshuffle that replaced Medvedev brought in Mishustin and the announcement of the amendments. But of course, then we had the spectacle of 84 year old Valentina Tereshkova uh, in the state Duma, um, suggesting that uh, Putin's terms be zeroed. And I like the quote that she, I like to quote her because I think that she really does sum up the legitimation strategy of this rule-based aspect and how it's understood. Um, she said, it seems that many outside of Russia don't like our amendments. We have hit some sensitive points with them. They don't like our plans because we defend our sovereignty. Here, the state is vulnerable. People might feel undecided. They can be manipulated. Society must feel secure and we need an insurance policy. And we have one. It's mighty presidential power. Let's not beat about the bush. All the conversations in the kitchens boil down to what will happen after 2024. If we're talking about him, Zachem Krutit i Mudrit, let's get rid of the limits if that's what the people want. So you might think the next stage was a bit surprising that they schedule a referendum after all, but again, it's important to have this because sending it through the legislative branches, the Duma and the Senate, is not going to provide legitimacy. The referendum is essential to provide that stamp. Of course, the other point is there's a degree of sloppiness in the execution of this in 2020. And what might that, what, how, where was that sloppiness reflected to some extent in the numbers that we saw of the voting, which showed irregularities? And of course, this Galasavanya Napinkak voting on the tree stumps, which 
was highly irregular. And of course, we had other kind of legal regulations and vote stuffing and things like this going on. Um, to some extent, it might reflect a dented state capacity during COVID-19. It might also reflect, as Sophia mentioned earlier, that it's not really about convincing skeptics that the regime is the best solution to Russia's problems. It's really perhaps more about a, a spot check on discipline within the elite, a checking the efficiency and reliability of governors and mayors in a power vertical. Can they deliver the desired results? Do we have this horizontal unity? So um, I will just eat very, very, very briefly onto Dennis's terrain, but, but Denise's terrain by talking about what response there have been in polling to this um, on the question of the constitutional amendments and extending Putin's terms. There seems to be quite a lot of polarization and very different ways of seeing this, a very, very three-way split, which shows that this kind of rule-based legitimation doesn't perhaps work. It doesn't create consolidation. It actually causes more um, polarization. But I'll leave that because we don't have time, I don't have time to unpack it. Moving on to the second dimension. The second dimension was beliefs, uh, the ideas, the values, the identities promoted from above. And most of our audience, uh, of course, will be familiar with um, a lot of these since 2012. And for a comprehensive coverage, you know, please see Brian Taylor for the values side, the code of Putinism, and for the worldview side, Ilya Yabokov, Fortress Russia, or Gulnaz uh, Sharafudinova, Red Mirror, I think, uh, comprehensively cover this. So under the beliefs, sort of category. We know there is a state-curated identity project that brings patriotism and loyalty to front and center. It's an implicit and sometimes explicit call for national unity to prevent collapse into chaos. And while the yes campaign for the referendum in included some diverse parts, such as social welfare, animal rights, I would highlight three pillars um, of the so-called ideological block of constitutional amendments. And these are, first of all, the focus on territorial integrity, political sovereignty, the question of protecting and conserving uh, culture and society that is unique and its civilizational space with traditional values. And thirdly, about it, there, was a, there was quite a big focus on historical memory. And these three pillars I saw particularly highlighted in the agitational campaign with some important cultural figures that were, were involved in this, in this, in this uh, referendum on state television. In this, uh, we have, of course, the question of ideological flexibility, which has been a previously a very big strength of, 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 uh, of the Russian government through the, through the decades, and the feeling that they're losing some of this flexibility. And as these nodal points are now written into the constitution and codified, um, what I would say about the rule, the, the beliefs dimension in 2020 is that, uh, well, there's a, an, is that a large part of it was tied in with World War II commemoration, the 75th anniversary of World War II, and this very powerful unifying national symbol. And um, it does a feel, it feel, it does look like these kind of, uh, this ideological block was kind of dumped on the population. I, I wasn't able to find any fiery debates or, or, or about the, the, pros and, the pros and cons of these different amendments in the ideological block, um, except for these one-sided state TV talk shows. So imposing this kind of, uh, without an open debate, um, and the peak years where these discourses resonated most powerfully, I would argue have passed, so that's 2012 to 2018. And we live in new conditions. Uh, Russia lives in new conditions where living standards are squeezed. Um, many regions are not flourishing. Ukraine is less interesting. Syria has been overplayed. and at the same time, COVID-19 has, has highlighted a lot of problems in state capacity and performance. So the question is, well, does this focus on external enemies, geopolitics, Russia's civilizational code, does it really still connect up strongly with citizens? Can identity politics keep on trumping the practical concerns of everyday life? And I don't have the answer to that because that is moving us onto the area of res resonance reception and the question of how successful legitimacy is as an output. Um, Finally, I have to cover appropriate actions. And um, appropriate actions, of course, we always talk about the centrality of Vladimir Putin because he's very important. Um, and in 2020, it's interesting to point out that while these transformations were occurred, while these quite, a quite detailed plan of action was being implemented in 2020, um, the Kremlin lost um, a charismatic and active Putin because he was stuck behind in, on a desk behind Zoom from March 2020, basically, more or less up till the end of the year and through to the next spring. So he could not hold the events he wanted, the, the, the World War II parade, the, leading the Immortal Regiment, being more active on the street for the Yes campaign, 
Um, instead of having images of Putin doing that on the street, we have images of uh, these um, voting on the tree stumps. Um, and so the listless board Putin, of course, was uh, one of the one of the many jokes. It was him playing with his pens on the different things he did with his pens, uh, throwing his pens on his desk or playing, you know, twisting his pens around. That was one of the uh, memes in the period. And of course, over time, we, we Navalny, I believe, coins this. But the, but the meme is, of course, the old man in the bunker. Um, Putin has built a bunker to protect himself from infection, and everyone must spend two weeks of quarantine to enter that to speak to him and be in the same place as him. So we had we know that Putin also took an uncharacteristic step away from running everything, and he and he devolved power in, in, in 2019 to the governors to run the COVID um, crisis. By June, the proactive plan is back and Putin is back on the screens. And a lot of the events that were planned for May were held in June with regards to World War II and the referendum agitation. Um, and by the end of the year, there was an, another attempt to kind of stir up uh, with some appropriate actions um, or with the war on supermarket prices where we saw a more engaged Putin um, rather than the more listless Putin that we had seen earlier in the year. And of course, his performance at the uh, Prima Linea, the direct line where he was uh, very competent in the way he handled everything. So um, Putin's ratings went down in 2020 and recovered back up by September. And that was an interesting phenomenon. It does appear that things like Nag Nagorno-Karabakh, Sputnik helped to sort of stabilize things. Um, and Putin takes the credit for the big international nation-wide level successes. And he doesn't take any flack for the disorder and incompetence in someone's village or town or region. That is not laid at his doorstep. So perhaps 2020, in this case, we see continuity with previous years, that Putin is still isolated or insulated from uh, any side effects. I finish today with um, what has been going on since then. Uh, of course, Putin has left the bunker, uh, if we continue the joke. Um, and of course, 2021 began um, annoyingly for Putin with um, protests of Navalny and all the attention being on Navalny and Navalny's arrest. Um, and he tried to wrestle it back. Um, and since his uh, particularly, I think, interesting is his appearance on the seventh anniversary uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of Crimea joining the Russian Federation, he gave a very uh, relatively emotional and raw performance um, talking about how the return of Crimea to the Russian nation demonstrated people's love love for the motherland, which is in the blood, character and genes of our people. We had rapturous chants of Russia, Russia around the stadium. And again, the aim of the spectacle was clear, revive some of the patriotic exuberance and euphoria of 2014, replay it, reboot it. Does it work? Um, his trip to the taiga is dipping into ice holes. It shows him as the Narodny president, the, the people's president. His sparring with Biden is back to the old tropes. Um, state media made, made the most of the contrast. Biden is mixing up his words. He's slipping on his way up to Air Force One. Meanwhile, Putin is out in the woods, the huntsman boldly challenging the US president to tell a debate, anytime, any place. So just to finish, the old methods with their heavy dependence on Putin's personality and charisma and these ideological kind of um, block, uh, these kind of um, nodes, um, we know that a healthy and vaccinated Putin is now out and uh, back on his horse. The question is, after all that's happened in 2020, will his horse still ride the way it used to? Thank you. Terrific. Thank, thank you, Matthew, and thank you for uh, for being on time. I was trying to figure out how I would get a message to you, um, other than sort of gesticulating wildly, um, but I didn't have to. So thank you. Um, so now we will turn to, I believe, Bo Peterson. Is that right? Um, and uh, so Bo Peterson, as many of you will know, is professor of political science at Namalmo University, where he's one of the founders of the research platform Russia and the Caucasus Regional Research. He, um, his special areas of interest include legitimacy, authoritarianism, national identity, and political myth, with a specialization in political developments in Russia and the former Soviet Union. He is widely published, including in journals such as Demokratizatsia, East European Politics, Europe Asia Studies, and so on and so forth. Over to you, Bo Peterson. Thank you very much. Um, see now. Um, so I, I think I will, can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, I will uh, basically take off where, where Matthew left uh, concerning the uh, 
the performances by by Putin and and um, the um, the action uh, part of, of this game concerning the legitimation game and um, the, uh, the 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 paper that I have not written for this occasion but the presentation uh, is titled and it doesn't appear anywhere so I'd better uh, mention that to you uh, is initiative lost uh, the the Putin presidency and the uh, Corona year challenges to uh, legitimacy um, and um, I, I don't have a, a um, uh, PowerPoint presentation for this occasion I have a couple of, of uh, uh, images that I will share with you a bit later on uh, if, if uh, technology uh, and my handling of it works uh, but anyway, uh, where I would like to start off then is to say that, um, uh, as you know, Vladimir Putin has built much of his long-standing power and legitimacy on appearing as a guarantor of things being done. Uh, and therefore, the extent to which he seemed to abdicate executive responsibility in the dealing with the corona pandemic has been surprising to many. <clears throat> Um, when he addressed uh, the uh, corona situation, uh, for instance, in March and April uh, last year, he seemed for a long time markedly uninvolved, and uh, much like many other world leaders, it has to be admitted, uh, he initially downplayed the severity of, of the pandemic. Um, according to the official statistics, uh, Russia has, by international comparison, performed relatively well regarding the death toll craved by, by the pandemic, but uh, strongly dissenting voices, including uh, the Russian statistical agency Rostat, uh, very convincingly have argued that the, the statistic, statistics uh, are wrong, they're skewed, and that death, death count should be increased at least threefold, um, and that preparedness has generally been poor all, all over the country. Uh, and of course, me, my starting point in all this is to say that uh, this is bound to reflect uh, negatively on Putin and, um, and, and his administration and its overall legitimacy. Um, in what uh, can presumably be seen as a variety of the a blame game strategy that uh, Putin has been known to revert to on other occasions th uh, during his long presidential career, uh, he, uh, as, as Matthew also mentioned, he largely shifted the executive responsibility for the uh, corona crisis management to the governors and other regional heads. And now I'll see if I can manage to share my screen here and find a quote for you. Uh, it doesn't really seem like that. Um, uh, okay, I will uh, wait, wait that. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, no, this was, this is another one. So, um, let me just say that, that, um, uh, as I suspected, uh, the, the, my screen sharing did not work out totally as uh, planned. Um, so I'll, I'll hope for, for better luck next time. Uh, but in practical terms, then, uh, Putin in the spring of, of uh, 2020 was quick to delegate the day-to-day um, uh, -day handling of the cri corona crisis and the visibility that emanated from it to the Moscow mayor, uh, uh, Sergei Sabyanin, and the regional governors, uh, loosely coordinated by the by Pr Prime Minister uh, Mikhail Mishustin. When Mishustin in, in April 2020 tested positive for the virus and headed into self-isolation and care, the graveness of the threat uh, was uh, very much underlined. So um, even if Mishustin headed and coordinated the governance task force uh, on the virus, Sabyanin played from the very beginning uh, an important role and was also appointed head of a working group on the corona in the president's state council. Um, and it has emerged that uh, Sabyanin apparently wanted to model the, the, uh, the, the corona virus lockdown uh, in Moscow on the tough measures rolled out in China and Singapore, uh, like closing the subway, deploying or even troops 
declaring curfew, but all in this, uh, um, uh, Putin ultimately overran him. Uh, Putin, very importantly, went against Sabyanin in his wishes to enforce a lengthier lockdown uh, in Moscow and uh, uh, pushed through a quick opening of the economy ahead of the, uh, of the national vote uh, on the constitution in July. Uh, it has to be said to, to Sabiana's credit that he was, uh, was uh, quick to realize the uh, public health disaster that was looming and uh, therefore wanted strong measures to combat uh, the virus. Uh, some measures were not very effective, admittedly. Uh, and um, this went, uh, for instance, for the uh, issuing of digital passes that was, were required for using the uh, city's transportation system. Uh, which led to overcrowded entry points to the subway as the passes were scanned and checked and those overcrowded um, gatherings were of course not very conducive to the combating of the virus, or the spread of the virus, of course. And it has to be said that such missteps along the way uh, seem to have hurt uh, Sabiani's public image uh, somewhat. Uh, also a Levada poll indicated in the early fall of 2020 uh, that his ratings, that his rating had receded somewhat during the year. Um, and uh, it has also emerged uh, pretty clearly that Putin was not very happy about uh, Sabiani's rise to celebrity, uh, since many regional heads followed his lead in the combat against the virus. Um, this could, of course, again, uh, feeding into the speculations, have meant a springboard to the position of emerging as something like, uh, well, the, the uh, uh, heir apparent to, to Putin. Um, anyway, the bad vibrations seem to have been felt by Sabianin, who uh, uh, turned down his public profile uh, and decided to fall into line. And here comes something that I wanted to, to share with you, uh, if, if that now works. Um, uh, Um, well, yes, uh, at a publicly reported meeting uh, with Putin in the early fall of 2020, Sabianin appeared to be very aware of the risks. The bilateral talks between the two men uh, were largely about the actions that the Moscow city authorities had taken to combat the pandemic. Uh, describing the measures, uh, the, the mayor took pains to attribute as much of the credit as possible to the president. Uh, he went, really went out of the way to do so. Um, uh, and uh, regardless of whether he wanted to give him credit for support packages, instructions, or just uh, providing general uh, inspirations, the polite nods were uh, so many uh, as to be um, servile indeed. Uh, the list of such references by Sabiani was very long, and when reading the excerpts from the conversation between the mayor and the president that was recorded, that was published on the, uh, on the official uh, Kremlin.ru website, uh, then one really got the impression of, of uh, one of the old uh, boyars uh, visiting uh, a disgruntled Tsar and trying to please him. Uh, so we, one could, in that excerpt, from, in those excerpts from the conversation, find uh, elements like, well, all the decisions that we took were coordinated with you, you helped to transfer, following your instructions, you were absolutely right when you set us a fairly serious job of controlling the situation, we received instructions from you, you are absolutely right, and so on and so, so forth. And, um, so as not so, so as to rub in this this uh, message, then uh, there was this image uh, published on the uh, official Kremlin website, uh, which shows very much uh, a highly marginalized Sabian in here on the right hand side of of, of, the, of the screen, and of course uh, there's a huge dominance here at center stage by uh, of by Vladimir Putin. And, and uh, this is to underline, of course, that, that no one else is really uh, allowed into the, uh, to the limelight. Uh, so that was the one of the, uh, the, the main elements uh, that I wanted to bring up. The other one is, of course, the, uh, uh, the uh, 
the, the Sputnik issue, uh, the vaccine issue, uh, which uh, was the glaring exception to, uh, to Putin's uh, inactivity and, and detached mode of, of governing during that, the, the year of 2020 and 21. Uh, when it comes to uh, combating the virus, because this was the area where he really took the opportunity to uh, to try to shine and to to bring this out as a major uh, breakthrough technologically and and uh, scientifically, and um, uh, to uh, to promote the uh, the vaccine as as a major export commodity. Uh, not not least to uh, to the EU, um, and uh, uh, it it uh, it was as if this was a very deliberate strategy to kind of balance the uh, uh, the uh, the lacking um, action uh, earlier during the year, uh, as if the uh, uh, the vaccine was brought out uh, also. Uh, underlined by the name, of course, the uh, highly, highly um, symbolically uh, named Sputnik after the uh, past successes in the uh, Soviet uh, space uh, contestation with, with the United States during the Cold War. Uh, but uh, so, so in, in, in this manner, uh, there was a, a kind of a very uh, evident compensation effort to, uh, uh, to play this out as a trump card. Uh, to show that the, the president is very committed and he personally gave instructions to start also to uh, vaccinate uh, on, on a large scale level. Uh, Russia was the first country to develop and to, to have a vaccine approved and Russia was the first country to uh, start uh, uh, a, a vaccination campaign on a massive level. Uh, then of course he, uh, Putin in this legitimation game he ran into some bad luck uh, in the sense that uh, the public has been hard to sway and uh, not very uh, enthusiastic, to put it mildly, about taking the jab, and and also one could one could uh, of course um, uh, reflect upon the fact that that uh, Putin himself failed to turn uh, his taking the jab uh, into a um, uh, photo opportunity uh, to to underline the. Um, uh, the successes and the, um, uh, the excellence of, of, of the vaccine. Um, so, uh, but anyway, uh, even given those two relative setbacks, uh, one, uh, one has to, to see the, um, uh, uh, the, the um, promoting of the vaccine as a way of using it as a panacea to uh, to the different kinds of bads and ills that befell Russia and or rather the, um, uh, the, the Putin regime uh, during the years of 2020 and 21, not least to um, also to counterbalance the attention uh, gained by, uh, by uh, Alexei Navalny uh, and the uh, uh, drainage on the legitimation uh, on the legitimacy that uh, this has meant for the um, for the um, uh, Putin administration and the um, Putin regime, uh, but of course one one couldn't help to uh, to wonder whether it's this is not uh, uh, somewhat too weak a medicine uh, to be administered uh, against uh, legitimation loss and um, and the uh, setbacks that that um, uh, were suffered by the by the regime uh, during uh, that uh, pretty. Um, um, Difficult year, uh, 2020, and also this is the uh, start of 21. So, uh, can a vaccine be uh, administered as a panacea against a um, progressively waning charismatic authority uh, and popular support? I beg to wonder. I beg to differ about that. So, I think uh, I am done, and I hope I stayed within the limits of time. You've made me redundant as well, uh, Bo. Thank you very much for the presentation and for keeping on time. A lot of a lot of food for thought. Um, our fourth uh, presenter today is Denise uh, Volkov, who is a sociologist and deputy director at the Levada Center. Uh, over 13 years with the Levada Center, he's been involved in more than 100 quantitative and qualitative research projects on different aspects of Russian society. 
He's authored works on sources of uh, uh, the political regime support, political attitudes of Russian youth, protest activities in civil society, business and elite opinion in Russia. He was a columnist for Vedomosti, RBC, and the Moscow Times newspapers, and now writes for Forbes Russia and the Carnegie Moscow Center. Uh, look forward to your presentation, Denis. Over to you. Um, is he frozen? I don't think I'm frozen. It does appear that Denis is frozen at the moment, yeah. Okay. Let's let's. Uh, I think he said he's connecting from his mobile phone. Maybe there is a bit of problem with that. Okay, okay. Often All right. Well, let's give minutes. it. It's a few minutes, and it just refreshes. It's my experience. So that's yeah. That's that's fine. No. Well, let me just take this opportunity. Oh, he seems to have disappeared. He'll come back in a second. But uh, once he does, I'll I'll just. Uh, but let me just take. You know. Fill, fill the air with a with a quick thought linking the three presentations we've heard so far, which are which are terrific and interesting, um, you know, uh, both theoretical and empirical. One of the things that I'll uh, I'll note, and uh, members of the audience will also have noted, that we're sort of moving beyond thinking of legitimacy as a sort of thing, a sort of substance that is either there or not. Um, it to thinking about strategies of legitimation, which is much more about process. Uh, a much more welcome and and more complicated <laughs> um, uh, thing to try to tackle analytically, but it makes sense in the context of authoritarian um, regimes. It probably makes sense in the context of democratic regimes as well, but that's not our topic uh, here here today. So that's something I would love to uh, you know highlight, and I want to say that links the the different the different papers. Um, I'll also say one of the possibilities that I always try to try to wrap my brain around, but it doesn't. I don't always succeed. But I, I'll throw this out there and just maybe as kind of a way of asking a first question that you know perhaps you'll have opportunity to 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 address down the road in our conversation, which is um, there's strategies of legitimation and there are these claims to legitimacy that are being offered, and obviously there's some. If it's a, to some degree about the process, then the process is aiming for a certain end, but it also is seeking, I would suggest, uh, at least on the Central Asian examples, to to clutter public space, right? It's just occup it's just sucking the oxygen out of public discourse. And, and I wonder how we would be able to distinguish that function of legitimation strategies from the more the, the 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 ways that you know the presentations focused on today, which is to say, aiming for a particular goal, which is some degree of minimal buy-in from either the elites or from the broader public or or key stakeholders or what have you. So, in other words, I mean, in a, here I'm thinking about Lisa Wadeen's work on on Syria, um, where she makes a, a strong case that really le legitimation strategies are simply to occupy public space and make other ways of thinking. Um, uh, harder to mount right not impossible but it just it just it just makes it very challenging okay i'd hoped that that comment would uh it would certainly has it. Denise, Denise is here now i believe i saw him oh is, he, is Denise here i don't see him okay i hope he is because I, I saw him reconnect yes he's just he's just connecting up now okay denise oh, when that? you're here uh speak up i don't see your your video it should just be now he's coming up, but I will definitely have a response to that question. It's a very excellent question, Edward. Terrific. Let's see where he is. Yes, Denise is here. I'm going to unmute him. I hope that he'll be able to join us now. Denise, can you? It looks like we may. Oh, yeah. We can't hear you, Denise, unfortunately. No, still can't hear. Yeah. In that case, well, perhaps we have to move to plan B. Sure. Um, uh, Masha, are you are you are you ready to to respond and? Um, 
So let me introduce Masha, and just with the caveat that if Denise uh, reconnects, maybe you, we can put a pause on your comments. Ab absolutely, of course. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Terrific. So let me uh, um, turn then to our discussant today. Maria Lipman is senior associate for Ponars uh, at the Institute of European Russian Eurasian Studies at, at George Washington University. Uh, she produces the Ponars Eurasia podcast, which I highly recommend. Um, she's also currently teaching Russia-related courses as a visiting scholar at Grinnell College in Iowa. Uh, she works on uh, issues of state-society relations, media, politics of history, and ideas. Uh, recently, she's published an edited volume entitled Russian Voices on Post-Crimea Russia, um, and she's also published on the media in the volume Putin's Russia, Past, Imperfect, Future, Uncertain. So we look forward to your uh, your comments and questions. Um, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I hope Denise can uh, actually join us, because otherwise uh, we will be deficient on the empirical side. But I'm sure everyone is familiar with uh, uh, Denise's work uh, and uh, the work of Levada Sente in general, uh, because, of course, uh, their surveys and uh, uh, their analyses are uh, well, very relevant, highly relevant to the issue of um, legitimacy. Um, now, uh, the three papers, uh, uh, three excellent papers that we've listened to so far, of course, focused more, uh, especially Sophia, of course, um, on the uh, uh, theoretical part. Um, and uh, uh, um, Denise, I hope, will talk about the supply side. Uh, legitimacy uh, is, of course, a complicated concept, and uh, there are various, uh, there are different definitions. Um, um, uh, to begin with, I will throw in a little bit of theory myself, uh, and especially um, one definition of legitimacy that I think is especially applicable to the Russian case, and that is the definition given by Juan Lenz. It goes like legitimacy is the belief that in spite of shortcomings and failures, the existing political institutions are better than any others that might be established and that they are therefore, um, uh, they therefore can demand obedience. A legitimate government, government is one considered to be the least evil of the forms of government. And I think this is indeed highly applicable to Russia. Uh, because ultimately uh, what we see in the uh, state society relations is uh, the government seeking to ensure that uh, the society is acquiescent, uh, not ardently supporters, not necessarily, um, and indeed the, uh, uh, the society itself is mostly, for the most part, shrewd enough to see the corruption and other flaws but still, people at large prefer to tolerate the regime as is and are apprehensive of change because change Russia. is seen. Yes. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. I mean, uh, can I ask? Denise is back. And, and okay. rather than rather than risk another uh, moment where we're Absolutely, disconnected. Absolutely. Of course. Of course. So yeah. um, sorry to interrupt, but uh, let's just take advantage of his of his presence and then we'll get back to your, your okay. uh, comments because you were onto something great, too. So, Denise. Thank you. Uh, sorry, sorry, everyone. Uh, great to be uh, with you today. I was uh, disconnected the very moment I was going to open my mouth. But now I, I, I hope everything will be uh, all right. So um, I will uh, speak, um, of course, on the results of uh, our uh, research, uh, regular surveys of uh, Levada Center and also occasional focus groups. Uh, that we do to supplement the uh, survey results and better understand uh, what people uh, think, how they formulate their thoughts. And I, of course, will be uh, talking uh, mindful of the upcoming uh, parliamentary elections. Uh, this autumn and probably uh, the uh, elections of 2024 uh, four of uh, uh, president uh, probably will show, uh, keep them in mind um, as well. So uh, what was uh, uh, going on uh, uh, lately, Matthew was uh, talking about it, but I think it is very important to keep in mind the deteriorating support uh, of the regime uh, to understand the, uh, the uh, current politics. So what are the main uh, sources of this deterioration? I think uh, they're pretty obvious. 
uh, pension reform that was uh, uh, seen as absolutely unjust by the majority of population. Economic uh, problems uh, that uh, were made worse by the uh, COVID pandemic, and I would say that uh, the, for, uh, uh, as people understand it and feel it, the economic uh, uh, economic uh, hardships were the main effect of the uh, pandemic in Russia. Of course, uh, not entirely, but it's how uh, people uh, feel it. Also, of course, the waning uh, post crime mobilization of this uh, patriotic favor, but though not the so called uh, Crimean consensus, because we, when we ask this, uh, uh, this uh, April, this question about Crimea, all these uh, uh, more than 80% uh, still say that, well, Crimea is ours and so on, but do not, they are more or less detached from this topic. And the, I think very important to mention is the rise of uh, uh, social networks. Uh, such as YouTube, like Instagram, that provide uh, uh, visual content and uh, which are the base, uh, the platforms for uh, video bloggers uh, who present their uh, uh, alternative views, uh, alternative to the um, state media and so on. And this rise came uh, only a couple of years ago, two or three years at most, when, we, when the social networks became these social networks uh, became uh, a mass uh, mass event mass uh, factor and uh, you may you may uh, see that all these uh, most popular video bloggers like Dut, like redactor like Vishoni Posner and others uh, are, were established only a couple of years ago be when the, this platform were established as a mass product and uh, they contributed this uh, uh, this phenomenon contributed very much to the growing polarization in Russian society uh, concerning almost all political questions so support uh, of uh, Putin of the United Russia party of Navalny of uh, constitutional vote of different protests uh, 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 and so on with the younger generation who is uh, getting the uh, uh, news on social networks, they are more critical, more supporters of the critics of the regime, more supportive of Navalny, and less supportive of Putin. Though I would, uh, I would ask you not to exaggerate uh, this polarization and not to exaggerate the, uh, the deterioration of support. Still, uh, the, uh, the Kremlin, the regime seems rather stable, though uh, it has to change its policy to secure its uh, it, uh, grip on uh, society. And uh, how it is uh, happening, I think the most spectacular was uh, uh, shown uh, to us, uh, demonstrated to us during the constitutional, the constitutional vote last year. And we saw in our uh, public opinion polls that uh, in society as a whole, pretty, uh, pretty similar uh, shares were in favor and against uh, 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 these uh, amendments. 40 in April uh, last year, 40 were in favor, 34 were against. But if you look at those who were going to, uh, to vote already in April, we, we saw that 52 of those who were going to vote were in favor and 28 were against. So we see that the new strategy uh, to uh, secure the support and the electoral results of any kind is through uh, mobilization of supporters of the regime through different uh, carrots, uh, through uh, help uh, to support uh, uh, financial support, all kinds of benefits and so on. And also addressing to these people directly by Putin and, and uh, others, uh, but also now it's very important to mobilize the critics and uh, so let them let, uh, make them uh, make them stay at home and not to influence any uh, 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 any elections, not to influence results of any elections in any kind. So we see, so we see these are different sticks for for the critics. And uh, so uh, uh, now it is uh, uh, very crucial uh, not only to bring the voters, the supporters for the ballot boxes, but also to secure all the critics stay 
stay at home and uh, to, uh, to eliminate any kind of uh, uh, pro protest vote and such instruments like smart vote of, of Navalny, for example, though uh, in itself, maybe it was not uh, that effective, but still it, it contributed to this uh, uh, protest vote to, mobili uh, to mobilization of uh, 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 those who were uh, uh, not, uh, uh, not happy with uh, Putin and United Russia Party. Uh, uh, but also uh, to discourage or uh, uh, um, eliminate any kind of political uh, opposition, political alternative, and to create kind of a vacuum, uh, a vacuum around Putin. And we see it in the, uh, it manifested itself in um, uh, our public opinion polls uh, that showed that though the uh, support for Putin was waning, the support for other politicians was not going up. So kind of uh, uh, vacuum. And so I think the most spectacular way of this discouragement was how the authorities uh, uh, pressed uh, uh, Navalny and his supporters, especially uh, with his uh, imprisonment and also how tough was the reaction to the uh, uh, um, protest of Navalny supporters. And we see that uh, the reaction was uh, in several ways. Uh, first, it was the hit of the infrastructure of uh, regional staff who actually provided, provided this all uh, Russia, all national scale of the protest because the, all these organizations were set up in recent, I think, uh, uh, three years in, uh, 18, in 2018 and, uh, and later. And they provided this uh, uh, national scale of uh, his movement. Uh, the other was the uh, discouragement and uh, the uh, punishment and uh, uh, brutalities towards the participants of the uh, of these protests uh, through uh, and the police uh, was rather brutal. And then uh, video cameras in Moscow was used in the last uh, uh, last protest to then after already after the protest to. Uh, uh, um, uh, not catch, but uh, to identify the protesters who were going through the streets of Moscow and then finding them and also uh, bringing them to police and courts. But also a very important to uh, uh, um, discourage sympathizers of uh, uh, sympathizing actually to this uh, protest. And we see it was uh, uh, done through uh, creative negative image, negative attitude to, towards this protest especially through portraying them as children protests, which was not actually the case, though, of course, the uh, uh, supporters of Navalny and his, uh, his team is uh, uh, with young uh, people, and there were a lot of young people in the protest, but of course not adolescents, but uh, those around 25, 35 people. But uh, in the um, overall uh, image, uh, in the national eyes, it was, um, it was the protest of children, adolescents, and uh, actually here the regime hit this growing polarization, which was uh, which is taking part in Russian society, and uh, about which the older generation is very anxious, and uh, somehow they uh, the the. Uh, the authorities were very successful in uh, using this uh, anxiety of all the generations, and all the generations are in favor of this rather uh, strict measures towards the protesters. And also discouraging journalists uh, uh, in disseminating information and writing about protests, not only through, uh, um, through uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, well, like for making uh, these uh, uh, media foreign agents and so on, but also uh, just uh, uh, jailing uh, some journalists uh, like uh, Smirnov of uh, Media Zone or uh, like Azar of Nova uh, uh, Gazette and also this trial of Doxa uh, journalists and so on. So I would say this, uh, these measures are rather effective maybe not in disseminating fear among the uh, uh, people, but uh, uh, more so in uh, uh, this uh, creating negative image of the protesters and also with the sympathizers creating the uh, feeling of futility.
that nothing will change, that you can go to protest, but you will do nothing. So, and like uh, people in focus groups uh, now say, so where is Yana Malin? What, what he has achieved, nothing. So uh, uh, this, I think, is uh, a rather, at least in a short, uh, short run, medium run, it is, it is, uh, uh, it is working. And of course, it's not only about uh, eliminating all alternatives. It's not only about him. It's also about people like Grudinin of communists or uh, Nikolai Bandaryanka, who is uh, a rising star of uh, Saratov communists who has more than 1 million subscribers again on YouTube. Uh, also against uh, Platoshkin, who is, uh, who is already in jail, uh, against Yulia Galyanina, for example. And pr the pressure not only on these uh, um, uh, interesting people uh, and bright people, but also it generally against open Russia of uh, uh, and uh, uh, against communists, uh, rank and file communists, and so on. So, what I try to say that uh, this strategy is uh, working, and uh, even with the deteriorating support, the regime is uh, uh, probably will get its uh, percentage, and the United Russia Party probably will get uh, the control of the parliament again in this changing situation. Uh, in this deteriorating support uh, with this uh, new uh, strategy. But of course, it, uh, it, um, all these actually create uh, anxiety and insecurity, I would say. And we feel this anxiety and security not in the actually society, but within the elites. So uh, though they still uh, will be uh, successful, I probably say so will be successful in uh, upcoming elections, but uh, this uh, feeling of insecurity, I think, uh, uh, well, this can make them uh, over overreact and over pressure, put over uh, pressure towards society, and then we will try. Well, we'll see how it will uh, backfire or not, but still. But right now, I think it's uh, that the authorities will get their way. And I will uh, end uh, here. Thank you. And sorry again for this uh, disconnection. No, ter terrific that you could uh, rejoin us and, and offer your comments. The authorities will get their way. Seems a, a pretty decent um, and safe prediction under, under the circumstances. Um, actually, Denise was uh, was offering the idea of, uh, you know, that the authorities were creating a feeling of futility, and I think that, Masha, that's more or less where you were. So, um, back to you. Yeah, thank you. Do I realize that we have just three minutes left? <laughs> uh, let me, uh, Matthew, I defer to you, since you were... Uh, should we? Yes, uh, the idea was we once Masha finishes our comments, then we have 30 minutes of discussion. Um, but I do understand oh, if, if some okay. people have to leave, I do understand. But that was the original okay. plan. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, so indeed, uh, now we have the uh, recipient end uh, from Denise. And I think it is very persuasive, as always. Um, so uh, um, the idea how we are stopped was that uh, uh, the society in general is acquiescent not necessarily uh, ardently supportive of the government and mostly shrewd, shrewd enough to see the corruption and to see other flaws, but still preferring to tolerate the regime as is and uh, being apprehensive of change still, uh, because change still is seen as more likely to make things worse, not better. Uh, the fact that Navalny is uh, only supported by about one fifth of the Russian population, I think is evidence for that. And I'm afraid even uh, this constituency will become smaller. I mean, uh, uh, um, Navalny's popularity will go uh, uh, down from 20% because, of course, he's now in jail. Uh, so from this perspective, uh, the, uh, uh, the government is seen, I think, by the public as not moral or generally good, but as the least evil. Uh, and stability is seen as unequivocally preferable to change. Uh, and change uh, seen as undesired. 
the government is fully aware of this preference and does its best to deliver. And if it cannot deliver stability to the extent that it used to, it at least focuses and uh, emphasizes the message that things are stable thanks to the government performance. Another uh, little piece of um, theoretical framework that may be useful uh, for this discussion um, is applied to Russia as an electoral authoritarianism. And uh, the notion that um, I would like to mention is authoritarian equilibrium. And equilibrium, of course, is also semantically close to stability. Now, the term was used by Adam Przeworski, who made an argument that authoritarian equilibrium, that is, well, let's say, stability of an authoritarian um, uh, government governance, rests mainly on three things. Uh, and he cites them as lies, fear, and economic prosperity, or lies, fear, or economic prosperity. And that's important. Uh, so lies, of course, is... Uh, 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 a paraphrase of ideology, propaganda, discursive strategy, what have you, however you want to uh, refer to it. Um, uh, economic prosperity is a thing long past. The government cannot deliver the way it used to and will not be uh, able to deliver, to deliver better to the people. Um, lies are no longer as effective as they used to be, at least with some constituencies, and uh, uh, Denise and his colleagues have written a lot about it, that the perceptions of the young, of those who do not watch television, are increasingly uh, uh, at variance with uh, especially the generation of their grandparents. So lies, uh, quote unquote lies, lies as propaganda, lies as ideology, lies at, uh, as, as discursive strategy is... Um, falling flat on that constituency. So what remains is fear. And fear, of course, also is just a very succinct way to uh, describe it. This was what Denise was talking about at the end of his presentation. Fear is repression. Fear is creating a sense of futility. Fear is uh, uh, the, the government creating a sense of um, anxiety. Uh, and uh, uh, um, I would even slightly disagree with uh, Denise that uh, actual fear is reduced uh, to the very constituency of the activists. I think it is aimed at broader constituencies. And for instance, a very recent piece of legislation that imposes strong constraints on what is referred to as educational activity, I think aims at broader constituencies that have to censor themselves. This is not a fear of being jailed, killed, uh, interrogated, what have have you, uh, but a fear of, uh, you know, falling in trouble with the government. And I think uh, this sense is uh, broader today. And uh, I believe that Nevada Center has results to this effect that show that um, among the fears that people um, uh, cite when asked, what is it that you're afraid of? The fear of uh, government uh, arbitrary rule has become higher in, uh, in uh, recent months, maybe a couple of years. Um, now, um, uh, if the government's uh, goal is indeed to maintain equilibrium or acquiescence, in other words, to ensure that the people accept the political order and don't try to challenge or change it, then we should look at the means and tools. And this, these, of course, are the legitimation strategies that um, all three uh, presenters um, were talking about. Um, so um, instruments of uh, um, uh, legitimation uh, are I think quite a few, but I think what is important is to differentiate when we look at the government's uh, policies, um, moves, um, is to differentiate between the ultimate goal, and this is to maintain the sense of uh, acquiescence, of uh, status quo is better than change. It's futile to try and change things e even if they are imperfect. And the government's need to respond to all kinds of shocks and all kinds of challenges that emerge nonstop, as in any state, actually. Uh, it can be um, a COVID pandemic, it can be a terrorist attack, it can be international developments, it can be an economic crisis or mass protests. Challenges are a lot. And maybe uh, I think it can be said that uh, governance in Russia has become much more challenging to the Kremlin than it used to be. But when the government responds to those challenges, uh, I think, uh, and this is probably a question to ask of the presenters, um, probably not each time it has the goal of maintaining legitimacy. You mend this problem as it emerges, but of course you keep in mind the ultimate goal. 
Uh, and uh, uh, I think this should uh, um, make us uh, stop and think a little bit when we uh, see the way the government responds to the COVID pandemic and say, well, actually they failed. Uh, this was not the way uh, they should have acted uh, in order to maintain legitimacy. I think they were responding to a problem like uh, many governments of the world. Um, and uh, uh, the, of course, the legitimacy may have gone down a bit, uh, but uh, um, um, it's not because um, the government was not thinking about legitimacy at the moment. It's because they were concentrated on solving this particular problem. Um, but the government always keeps the broader perspective in mind at the same time. Um, problems, problems happen, challenges happen. Uh, the Kremlin has the instruments, and this is what Janice was talking about, to mend uh, the uh, um, failing, uh, declining legitimacy, declining popularity, declining rating, um, when uh, something, some factors, some events uh, actually lead to um, a decline in approval rating. So, um, uh, so uh, the uh, main concern of the government is that uh, the risk of change remains unacceptable. Uh, and of course, uh, um, uh, this risk would uh, deter people from thinking about change. So the cost that people are paying for stability for maintaining the status quo should remain acceptable and the risk of change not. And I think so far the government has actually uh, succeeded in that. The regime uh, uh, is, um, um, well, uh, Matthew said that the flexibility, uh, the regime no longer has the, the sort of flexibility that it had before. And uh, I think you applied that to ideological issues. But in general, I think the regime has a uh, 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 good capacity for adjustment and readjustment to, uh, um, to mend problems as they arise. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think that uh, uh, this capacity has actually, um, uh, that, that the regime has become less skilled at that. Um, so uh, when we look at policies, I think uh, an important question is, uh, um, um, which steps are driven by the logic of maintaining legitimacy? or um, um, which steps are driven by the logic of patching and mending the problem that has just arisen. I think that's an important distinction. Uh, another important question, of course, is how we measure the efficiency of, legitima of, of legitimation. And uh, 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 this is what uh, I think Denise was talking about. Uh, from this perspective, I think the example of COVID and uh, um, the COVID vaccine uh, belongs to those issues, to those uh, uh, examples, when the government was not concerned about, or at least it was not its major concern, when Putin was boasting about the Russian vaccine and advertising it to the world, I do not think that he was concerned about uh, um, uh, legitimacy at home. And I would quote here Mikhail Vinogradov, I think one of the best Russian political analysts who wrote a few days ago, the topic of COVID no longer exists. Um, uh, by which he meant that the, the Russian public, interestingly, is uh, no longer uh, excited by this subject. Uh, regardless of the numbers, regardless of the fact that there are even official numbers that show that excessive mortality has grown quite significantly, uh, despite the fact that even the authorities occasionally, even though not very vocally, are talking about a third wave, still, somehow, uh, there is uh, uh, no longer an interest there among the public in this topic. And from this perspective, I think whatever uh, Putin was driven by when he advertised the vaccine was not uh, um, um, a goal of um, improving uh, or maintaining or consolidating the legitimacy. It was something else. I think it was his uh, uh, 
one of the games he's playing on the global stage, uh, sending a message that, uh, but not to the Russian public, sending a message to the world, see, uh, you uh, uh, criticized the Russian vaccine, you uh, uh, didn't trust in our vaccine, but in fact, it is efficient and uh, uh, um, uh, there are various countries of the world that are inter today interested in buying it. Um, so that, uh, that was my point. Not everything should be considered or may be considered from the point of view of, uh, has it served the goal of consolidating legitimacy? Maybe the goal was something else. Um, and uh, um, a couple more points that I wanted to make. Um, one it has to do with uh, ideology. Um, here, I think the focus, uh, um, uh, in, um, I think, Sophia and uh, Matthew's uh, presentations were on the supply side, not on the recipient end. Uh, on the supply side, uh, myself, I'm very interested in these issues. It is fascinating to watch uh, what the government is able to produce, who are the producers, who are the so-called ideological entrepreneurs, the term used by Marlene Laruel. Uh, but on the receiving end, uh, I'm not sure there is uh, uh, too much interest in it. Um, and uh, uh, um, uh, interestingly, I, I think uh, uh, Denise did not even talk about it. Um, uh, he talked about something else, about other strategies of uh, legitimation. Uh, there's been a lot beginning with the constitutional amendments and, of course, history laws and uh, uh, what have you on Russian greatness and World War II. I think uh, uh, there is uh, um, an array of ideological entrepreneurs and uh, they are uh, constantly working on producing something that they might think will be in demand in the Kremlin. Uh, and they are producing a lot. Uh, but uh, if we look at the actual um, uh, key points, uh, they are essentially the same. Anti-liberal, anti-Western, Russia's greatness, World War II, um, moral conservatism. I think that's about it. It hasn't changed. I think there is more uh, focus, more emphasis on those issues. Uh, but uh, there is no more concreteness on those. And if we look especially at the... Uh, politics of history, uh, the uh, um, uh, vision of history remains as blurred as it was beyond World War II uh, is something that we believe in and uh, uh, that we pledge allegiance to. Uh, otherwise, uh, it is very, very vague, uh, uh, despite um, uh, all the effort of ideological entrepreneurs. Uh, and the Kremlin actually does not emphasize it too much. I don't think it does. And I think it's become, I'm, I'm coming to my last point. Um, uh, it's become uh, somehow trendy among political analysts in Russia lately to compare the uh, uh, situation of the atmosphere of today with that of stagnation. I think a major difference uh, lies in that, there are similarities, no question about that. Um, uh, but one of the major differences to me is that the government still does not intrude too much on uh, people's individual pursuits, uh, quite unlike the Soviet government. Uh, uh, Denise, I, I think Denise mentioned, but maybe I read it in uh, today's piece that I admired a lot uh, um, about the perception of COVID in Russia. Uh, and uh, in that piece, Denise explained um, how the government does not want to push people to get vaccinated because they don't want to. Uh, and his explanation is that it's because the government does not want to upset them. It does not want to exasperate them. Uh, so this desire to actually leave people alone to the extent that it is possible, those people who do not make trouble, those people who do not uh, actually rise against the government, who are not arrogant or audacious enough to challenge the uh, politics of the Kremlin, the government tries to, uh, to leave them in peace, uh, especially since the government can no longer deliver as well as it did in uh, uh, Putin during uh, Putin's first decade. Um, so uh, a very final point um, to the question that Matthew asked in his presentation, whether the uh, regime is acting in a defensive mode or whether uh, it is determined to reboot its legitimacy. I think this is a very good question. 
uh, but as, as I think Matthew you said yourself not necessarily mutually exclusive um, I would uh, actually, um, of course it's defensive. Of course uh, the regime now responds to all kinds of challenges. And uh, uh, Denise was also talking about it and uh, uh, in other presentations, this was also mentioned and it's obvious why. Um, but uh, um, re rebooting, uh, bringing back Putin on horseback, I don't think is realistic and I don't think actually this is the goal. Uh, uh, Putin uh, no longer looks as attractive they adjusted as he used to, even to those who, to whom he used to look attractive. Uh, I don't think that's the goal. Uh, I think the goal is that of dividing, not uh, uniting. Again, Denise was talking about. We saw uh, Putin the uniter uh, in 2008 when his, his approval rating was over 80%. We saw him as divider, as a divider after mass protest of 2011 and 12. We saw him as a uniter again at the time of the annexation of Crimea and for a few years after that. Now he's back to his dividing, his divider mode and he will remain in that. One interesting point is that um, rather than rebooting the legitimacy, um, according to some observers, some analysts, and I will cite Nikolai Petrov, um, a colleague of mine who is, has been currently writing that the regime is indeed already changing and changing toward actually putting gradually, very slowly and in, almost uh, unnoticeably uh, moving away from every, everyday decision-making. So we'll see whether this reconfiguration is indeed in place and whether Nikolai Petrov and others who share his uh, analysis are right. Uh, but uh, uh, a rebooting of Putin, Putin re-emerging as once again, Jan uh, you know, driving planes and everything uh, that can be driven. I don't think we'll see that. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. And I just wanna check um, with Matthew in terms of the timing, are we, scheduled to end on the hour or what do, do we have 30 minutes i mean i have nowhere to go but i but others may um, yes I, I perhaps because of some different technical things we've gone over that when we expected to end uh, earlier but um I'm, I'm still happy to continue the, the discussion okay. for for 30 minutes uh, but i do understand well, if we yeah. sure i'd like I, I think it would be, make sense to give the different speakers a short can we say two minutes um, just to sort of uh, extremely briefly respond to um, some of Masha's terrific points, and, and you, you'll probably have ample opportunity to, to weave in fuller answers um, as we get questions from the broader audience as well. Does that work for people? Um, uh, so let's let's start with uh, Sophia. Uh, any anything you'd like to respond to? Please go ahead. The floor is yours. Well, um, thank you very much, Maria, for your quite thought-provocative feedback, and I, I do agree with a lot of things you mentioned, that uh, it's indeed uh, here is a question of um, cost of stability, and stability that is aligned quite closely, but not there with stagnation. Mm. And, um, and I agree probably that not every step should be viewed uh, from legitimation perspective. And uh, in fact, I believe that probably uh, coercive um, measures should be seen as uh, um, signals of uh, legitimacy crisis. Um, um, and to comment uh, on Edward's um, earlier mentions of um, uh, distinguishing strategies and claims, um, well, obviously, Vidin was writing about uh, public, symbolic public spectacles and um, how authoritarian uh, leaders um, sort of produce self-believing prophecies through that uh, spectacles. Um, and that's a very powerful argument. But I would say that the difference between claims and strategies um, still exists because you do need to invoke some form of effective evidence or action to support uh, the claim. 
And as we know in Central Asian cases, for example, if we are talking about a development strategy, Kazakhstan 2030, it was supported by um, powerful um, policy uh, activities uh, that have uh, been received with high success. But in fact, the next uh, the strategy, which was uh, Kazakhstan 2050, failed miserably because it wasn't supported by the same um, uh, regime uh, efficiency in that respect. Uh, so there is a blurred um, distinction between two. Uh, may I also ask a question, or we leave questions for for later? I think it's okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you could, if just if you can ask it briefly, that would be terrific. Or, or maybe let me think a little bit more, and then I I get back to my question. Thank you. Sure, sure. That's that's terrific. Um, thank you, thank you for that. So, if you're getting to a question of you know when do legitimation strategies work and when do they when do they fall flat or fall on deaf ears and I think that that's uh, something that is um, in the background of our considerations here Matthew thank you uh, thank you Maria for these uh, really fascinating comments I've made lots of notes but I'll just two two responses uh, the first is on ideological flexibility and this is very much a difficult question to get a definitive answer on right now um, but I would just sort of focus in on World War II and these red lines these ideological red lines across which after you cross, you're a non, you're a non person politically, you're, you're dead in the water. And I think that's the first step towards an ideological regime, potentially, but there is still plurality of actors and there are different ideological entrepreneurs. And I would point everyone's attention to a round table that was held earlier in March called uh, a round table on informational pol policy of the Russian Federation. And it has an excellent collection of these different actors that are competing um, to show themselves as the hawks. In, in patrolling these red lines. Um, but yes, we don't know um, where it's going to turn and whether or not we will, uh, these, these ideological elements really will be enforced because yeah, they're in the constitution, but will they emerge into laws and practices and will the state enforce them? And if they do, we're in a different um, scenario than we were in four years ago, for example. Um, and the second point is a very important one. And that's, you know, external challenges that come out of nowhere, the government has to respond to and deal with versus the bigger plan if there is a bigger plan, which we can't see, we can't always see the bigger plan, we have to speculate. And I think that my view of the last couple of years is that um, 2018 was a false dawn when it looked like the attention was, the legitimacy strategy was gonna change and there'll be a focus on improved state capacity and performance, delivering services, enforcing the rules of law and having these national projects front and center. Crimea, Syria, let's put it in the background. And it didn't, even now there's two ways of looking at this. Either it didn't work and they gave up, or they never really planned for it to work from the beginning. And the idea was always for 2020 to be a big year when there would be this idea of a reboot. And of course, I would just add on front of it, a failed reboot potentially, but the idea of just kind of kicking things. What, what do I mean by reboot? You reboot when your computer is full of programs that are crashing. That's when you reboot, you get a, a, free, a fresh start and you can open the programs again, the ones you want to open, right? And that's why I use this term reboot. Um, so, and so in this sense, if you take this interpretation, then the external events are like flies that come into the room that have to be swatted away. And then you can get back to your plan, your agenda, your pre-existing agenda. Mm -hmm. And I think that's my kind of position on it. But, um, but that is, uh, that's, the, that, that's, really, that, that's why I would respond to the to comments. Perfect, thank you. Um, Bo Peterson. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And, and, and thank you indeed, Maria, for great points uh, made. Um, uh, I'll try to address uh, them um, from my perspective. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that, that the differentiation between uh, studying legitimation attempts and legitimation efforts on the one hand and legitimacy on the other uh, is a strategy which I sympathize fully with and, and, and adhere to myself. Um, but in some respects, um, it, while it, it, it solves uh, many problems, it also creates others uh, in the sense that um, to uh, get back to your point about not everything being made in, 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 to, uh, in, to use as uh, strategies of legitimation, that, that is not the overriding uh, uh, priority, uh, then certain actions taken uh, or certain actions not taken 
can have uh, adverse effects on legitimacy. Uh, and that is where I believe we could we should bring into the question here, because while I don't uh, argue at all uh, that the uh, the actions taken or not non not taken in order to combat the um, uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic uh, were made in order to uh, to legitimate uh, the uh, the uh, the regime, uh, then some shortcomings there, several shortcomings, may have adverse effects on legitimacy. And um, while I fully agree with you that that uh, crisis management was certainly the, uh, uh, the, the first priority there, um, then uh, certain tracks followed or not followed, and this, the strategy of, uh, of crisis management is bound to have had negative effects on legitimacy. And one of those is, uh, I would still uh, underline uh, the, uh, the Putin strategy of basically uh, going into hiding and, and uh, well, shifting the blame uh, to the regional governors. I, I, the, the, the quote that I uh, didn't manage to uh, produce to you earlier was when, uh, from a, an address he made to, to, to a congregation of of government, government members and regional governors in November, where he said that colleagues, you have received broad powers for implementing anti-pandemic measures and nobody has relieved you of personal responsibility for the adopted measures. I really do hope that they were adopted on time or unfortunately the non-adopted ones in some cases. And that is definitely a, in my book, that is a blame game um, strategy that um, at least if, if if the world was the world out there was fair, it should give adverse effects. It should give negative effects. Um, and and uh, then the second point I wanted to make also on the. Um, uh, oh, on if you could be just uh, if you could be a, a brief on the second point, that would be great. I, I promise I will okay. be. Um, on the vaccine uh, and and uh, it's not being. Um, uh, well, played so so uh, so prominently in order to uh, uh, to, to um, enhance the standing uh, in the domestic audience among the, uh, on the public. Um, then, uh, yeah, I fully agree that there is uh, an external uh, audience that that uh, also uh, is imp of importance here, but that does not rule out necessarily that there was also an intended side effect for the uh, for the public but that it misfired, that it never took off, uh, that it didn't fly. So, so well, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Terrific. Um, and over to, to Denise for a couple of minutes. Okay, only maybe a short uh, addition. I think uh, uh, Maya was uh, talking about it, but maybe to reiterate it, the importance of this anti-Americanism anti-Westernism in the, uh, not, maybe not even boosting support, but in discrediting, uh, again, the alternatives uh, with Navalny, uh, with uh, uh, other politicians, just uh, uh, to portray them as spies, as uh, the, even this foreign agent uh, law, it's all, everything about this, uh, about spying for the West and so on uh, and so forth. I think it is uh, it is interesting and uh, uh, important, and also about the overall narrative of Western involvement in Belarus and Ukraine, and uh, also uh, several years ago, uh, people were saying that do you do you want uh, the same as Ukraine? Now they say do you want as as in Belarus? Uh, uh, so it's a new narrative, but again uh, about the Western involvement and that. Russia should uh, fight it and, uh, uh, yeah, and, to, uh, and to fight it also in, in home, in, uh, in, uh, in domestically in politics uh, and here. That's terrific. And just, just a brief comment from me before we open it up to the uh, broader audience. It's, uh, it does seem that the part of the strategy is to adjust the baseline expectations, right? So it's not just a striving to produce something positive, but it's 
to adjust the ex adjust the expectations that the broader public uses to evaluate the rectitude of the regime, right? And so that's a constantly changing kind of uh, kind of game, uh, one might imagine. Okay, let's open it up to any questions that we have from the uh, from the audience, and I'm happy to. I think the best way would be to indicate in the chat that you have a question, and then we can turn it over to you to ask it orally. Um, I see. Sorry, Matthew, you're, Matthew can't hear you. Apologies. Uh, people can also raise their hands by clicking on the reaction button uh, and we'll see that. You can, we can connect you this way. That's right, okay. So uh, Mikhail Maslowski has a, has a question. Do you wanna ask it, Mikhail? I suppose I could read it. Yep. All right, I'll just, I'll, I'll go ahead and read that. So um, Mikhail asks, or comments that uh, that Max Weber distinguished between genuine charisma and quote unquote manufactured charisma, which was in Weber's view characteristic for modern pleb plebiscitary regimes and which could be produced with the use of mass media. Um, more recently, post Weberian so political sociologists um, have applied the latter concept, that is to say manufactured charisma to several 20th century authoritarian states question is this, are we dealing mostly with manufactured charisma of the political leader in the case of today's Russia? And he says, uh, this is a question particularly to Sophia and Matthew, though I imagine anybody could address this. Are, is this manufactured charisma of the political leader that has uh, much to do with our mass media kind of environment? I'm happy to respond first. Uh, if um, that's, that's the big, big question, of course, that's the, that's the million dollar question because in this current transformation, are, are we seeing a, a, a big increased reliance on manipulation, on administrative resources than before? Um, and of course, my starting point would be to say that uh, from the criminal's point of view, you don't want to have to manufacture charisma. You want real charisma. You want as much real popularity as you can get. And th there's a reluctance, as Maria mentions, to close the system down. So I just think we should keep in mind these two typologies in authoritarian regime literature the hegemonic um, party regime and the closed um, authoritarian regime, China versus Russia, I think, we compare the two, there is a desire to win the contests as convincingly as possible with as, with as least, with as little manipulation as possible. And so, but if not, then they will, then what the question is, are we moving towards a phase where this manipulation is just being used far more? And I would just build upon that by saying, well, what, well, um, I'm so glad that Denise was able to cover this question of repressive actions. For studying legitimacy in authoritarian con context without any, look at, without any coverage of the repressive aspect is, is problematic. So if I had to summarize what Denise was saying, it's a very selective um, and low profile kind of repression compared to the sort of totalizing party state of China, which is in everyone's kitchen, everyone's dwar apartment and everyone's street and workplace. So. But, but there, is there a long-term cost? If you start using manipulation a lot, and then you have this loss of debate, you have the, the sort of loss of information channels because everyone's afraid to publish things, you have mass apathy, you have stagnation, not just economically, but in terms of just discussions and culture and, and sort of vitality is drained out. And then there, there's a problem with that. I think people in the Kremlin are aware of because they grew up in the Soviet Union and they saw that. That, that kind of system over the long term. So I would still say that, that we don't know the answer to this, but I would suspect that there's a reluctance to go down that road. Um, but what we're seeing today, we don't know, how, that'll take time to find out over the years. Perfect, uh, anybody uh, else? Sophia, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mikhail, for pointing out uh, this uh, important um, dimension of charisma. Uh, I think we are indeed dealing with a constructed charisma. As you remember, there was this famous article that starts with the question, who is Mr. Putin? With exactly pointing out that a former KGB official is trying to be as um, uh, secretive as possible in um, pro projecting uh, his identity, yet as a uh, leader of a, um, a big nation, he needs to um, uh, sort of communicate his identity to a wider audience. So, um, and obviously media space helps to, to project that constructed charisma. Thank you. 
Um, it, it, so I see your hand, uh, Masha, just uh, Bo and Dennis on this question, anything? No? Okay, uh, Masha, oh. please, because this is uh, your territory. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, just a couple of words. Um, I, I think uh, it's really hard to differentiate between uh, manufactured 100% and genuine. However, I would uh, remind uh, everyone of the time when Putin, uh, Putin's charisma was in full bloom, when uh, uh, there was this song, Hachu um, Kak Putin, right, uh, sung by very young women. I want uh, apparently a husband or a boyfriend uh, such as Putin. I think uh, it is unimaginable today that Putin can win back young people, men or women, uh, uh, but uh, there was a time when he had his actual charisma, and uh, uh, that was true, I think, by the end of his second term in 2008. That was also true after the annexation of Crimea and the time uh, for rally around the leader effect. Um, I do not believe and I don't uh, share the uh, uh, um, uh, analysis of those who call Putin a man uh, without a face, a mediocrity. I think uh, he... Uh, was and remains a savvy and talented politician, certainly with a charisma. But uh, I think the kind of charisma that he used to have is fading away. And the key question today is whether indeed, as uh, I was saying already, the regime and Putin personally will be able to somehow gradually drift away, maybe uh, backstage or sideways or somewhere. Um, and uh, uh, the way there's a limit to uh, manufactured charisma, I think, can be uh, exemplified and illustrated by President Medvedev. It's not that the system did not advertise him. It's not that he did not have uh, time on air. Uh, the Kremlin worked for him. Uh, he didn't have even uh, you know, a modicum of the kind of charisma that Putin had never achieved that. He was attractive to some constituencies, and by the way, to the young people, but not because of his charisma. They uh, thought of him as gadget loving, as more progressive, as younger, as softer faced, without a KGB past, uh, but not of somebody uh, infinitely attractive. Terrific. Um, there's a question here um, from Arzu Sharanova. Uh, the question is this, um, I guess to all panelists probably, uh, what are in your opinion legitimation challenges that the Kremlin faces today in the era when social media is developed? So I guess uh, you know you can rephrase this in a, in a variety of ways, one of which is what difference does the, the social media make? Um, sorry, what difference does social media make in terms of um, strategies that are being mounted, challenges perhaps to, um, uh, to dominant narratives and, and so on? Um, should we start with, uh, Denise, do you, have, do you have any thoughts on this? Have you done any polling on the role of social media? Uh, well, the, the role is, I think, uh, uh, very interesting. And uh, it is, uh, at some point, uh, a recreation of the situation of uh, uh, late 80s, uh, early 90s, when uh, the uh, alternative uh, sources uh, of uh, uh, analysis of uh, different agendas are uh, suddenly available, uh, which was not the case in Soviet times, and it, it, which was not the case uh, even five, ten years ago when uh, state uh, television, uh, uh, which was uh, put under state control uh, uh, in uh, early Putin's here, uh, it dominates the uh, the views of the absolute majority of uh, uh, population was the main source of information. Uh, now is uh, suddenly there is a, I mean, a, several, well, many channels sprang up uh, which uh, deliver this uh, alternative views, not only politicians, uh, even the politicians. Navalny was the first, but again, I, as I was saying, it's not only Navalny now, it's uh, 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 people like uh, Bandarenka, like Yashin, like Sobol, who uh, gain their popularity through social networks, but also channels like uh, Redakts, like uh, Dudes, like Nizhny, uh, 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 interestingly, the 
uh, Telegram channels, which are, will have a reduced influence, but I think they're very influential in the uh, informed minority of uh, population with elites, even I think. I think this is a, a new uh, situation that uh, Kremlin yet could not put under entirely uh, its control. It's trying to do it uh, now, but uh, uh, and uh, quite in uh, several years we have this polarization I was uh, talking about. Uh, so yes, and uh, another problem connected to it, uh, obviously it is the, uh, that the Kremlin is uh, more or less uh, uh, losing the um, younger generation. Though again, I think uh, we should not uh, exaggerate it, over exaggerate this uh, situation, but, uh, but uh, yes, Kremlin and Putin and the uh, bureaucrats are losing their appeal with the younger generation because they're out of date now. They're just uh, looking old and uh, absolute. That's, and this is the problem. Anybody else on this uh, on this question? Uh, briefly, I'm Matthew. Happy, happy to follow up. Um, yes, and I think. The, the, the social media um, and the state media, these kind of two worlds fighting each other, that's the essence of this so-called information war. And uh, it's fought by the Kremlin, it's fought by individual people that are involved in it. And it was like, I think there was about 200 million, uh, uh, more than that was spent on this information, so it's just for new funds being pumped into it um, for Kisilov and Samarian and for them to have uh, keep up to date, that's the agenda, to keep making what is coming on state media as modern and as fancy and for the youth as possible. Um, it's very difficult to, to track who's winning the information war. Um, in terms of social media, we also have to remember that it has a dual, it has a double effect. On the one hand, we know that social media brings people together who wouldn't have otherwise got together and gets them to do things they may never have done if they hadn't been on social media. And it fights against atomization in that way. But on the other hand, it also has a polarizing effect is creating an us and them and separate and an ending civil dialogue. You don't listen to the person that's your so-called enemy. You just think about how to insult them. And I think we can say on this side, social media will, will continue to be ambiguous in terms of it being a tool of regime legitimization and also a threat to the regime. And they will have a difficult dilemma about how to control these platforms. And we, we saw it this year with slowing down Twitter and other things like this. And this is a fascinating area and a very good question. Yeah, and, and following on from that, there's a, there's a question from uh, Gabriel Scaliz, sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, uh, who mentions that, uh, for example, Putin ab avoids mentioning Navalny while pushing fake alternative opposition candidates. Does this non-mentioning strategy really work? And uh, continuing says, in France, when traditional media avoided talking about the Yellow Vest movement, it allowed them to polarize on social media as rebels, or I guess position themselves as rebels against the media agenda, right? So, and you get echoes of this in the U.S. under under Trump, right? The mainstream media says nothing, uh, by definition, can say nothing that's true, and uh, and therefore anything that's alternative is is by definition um, uh, by contrast true. Um, so, further further thoughts on whether this uh, works, Bo. I would say that the non-naming strategy is a non-starter. It's uh, it's just emerges uh, emerges as pathetic, um, and and gives you the association, if anything, to uh, to the non-naming of uh, Lord Voldemort in the Harry Potter books. It has a rather the opposite effect. Everyone agree. Is this self defeating? And if it's self defeating, then back to Masha's question about Putin as at least. For decades, a fairly adept political actor. What's he? What's he missing here? Is he simply just uh, overconfident in his uh, in his in his abilities? Is he miscalibrating the challenge? Is he? Um, uh, does he not care? Does he not have to care? <laughs> well, um, uh, I will actually. Um, I would point out that uh, Putin indeed avoided mentioning Navalny by name, but after a while, when Navalny was finally jailed, uh, uh, this policy was was abandoned, not by Putin, but by the Russian officialdom, and uh, uh, more importantly, by national television. Of course, uh, they only talked about him and showed him in order to smear and vilify him. But this, of course, raised the awareness. Uh, did not rise his popularity too much. And again, uh, Nevada Center um, uh, polls show that uh, 
his popular the awareness is very broad, but support and popularity and uh, the idea that he could be a leader for Russia is even smaller than the, uh, actually much smaller than the 20% who say that they approve of uh, his activities. The sense that he's a dangerous, suspicious troublemaker is quite broad, unfortunately. But the policy of, of no naming uh, um, uh, in the broad public space was abandoned as soon as he went on trial. Great. We have a couple of minutes uh, left here. I think we'll probably end in a, in, a, in a minute or two, but I wanted to give each of the panelists a chance if, they, if there's anything outstanding. Well, there's a lot that's outstanding, but if there's anything that's outstanding that can be summarized very briefly in a minute or so, um, please take take the opportunity. Who who would like to to start? Should we go, should we go backwards uh, from uh, our presenters? Denise, did you have anything uh, left unsaid that, mu that must be said? No, not really. Uh, I think maybe uh, what also important was not said that uh, uh, the supporters of uh, of Putin uh, on, on those who uh, he depend, uh, these people uh, do not have very big um, aspirations, and uh, it's they are very comfortable allies because they do not expect much of Putin, and uh, they are ready to adjust to the uh, situation, to the economic situation. And as uh, it is not a drastic uh, 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 troubles, economic troubles, though it's, uh, as it is a gradual uh, deterioration of living standards, these people have uh, uh, enough, uh, have enough uh, time to uh, adjust to it. And I think this is important, uh, uh, that uh, the uh, expectations, aspirations, are limited and uh, the ability and uh, the readiness of uh, uh, those who support Putin to, ad uh, to adjust to the deterioration, uh, deterioration of the economic conditions. Terrific, thank you. Um, Bo Peterson, any last thoughts? Uh, no, nothing to add really. Uh, thank you very much for a stimulating uh, conversation around the table. We should uh, get together more often. Absolutely. Our, 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 we meet in Zoomistan again. Um, uh, Matthew. Yes, I, I, I very much would like to finish on that note as well um, and say that I hope we will have another more events of this kind as we try to put together the some frameworks for comparative studies as well, because I think looking at Belarus, looking at Kazakhstan, looking at China, this is where the conversation gets even more interesting and we shouldn't stay in a Russian centered perspective only. So I hope that we will all be in touch and there'll be fresh news about other events. Fresh news, sounds, sounds terrific. Um, Sophia. Well, thank you for this terrific presentation. Uh, I think one big takeaway um, I'll be thinking about today is how um, a regime in crisis and, uh, and when, when regime is losing its uh, flexibility and stability qualities, how to unpack that. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, thanks again to, to all the panelists. And um, I, I learned a ton. I hope we'll do this, as Matthew suggests, uh, uh, more often as schedules allow. And there, there's much more, to, much more to tackle. So thanks. Good, good luck to everyone. And best for the rest of the day, wherever, wherever the day or, or the evening. Take care. Many thanks. Many thanks, Edward, for chairing. And many thanks, Maria, for fantastic discussion comments. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.